on that note, <clears throat> let, let us begin. My uh, good, good evening, everyone. My name is Leonid Polishuk, and I would like to welcome you to the seminar of the Center for Institutional Studies. We are very pleased to have as our speaker tonight, our own Sergei Popov. Sergei has two academic appointments at present, one at Cardio Business School in the UK, another one at the Center for Institutional Studies at the HSC University in Moscow, Russia. Yeah. Sergei's field can generally be described as applied micro, but much of his recent work has been introspection in our own profession. And the case in point is his today's presentation on tactical refereeing and survival of the fittest. Sergei. Thank you, sir. So this is, has been an idea of mine since 2018 or so, and it's like on the back burner. I'm trying to figure out whether there is like something that I'm missing in the whole story. And if I converge to that, it's pretty much everything. Then I'm probably writing it up and submitting, but I don't want to make some uh, decisions that would like make everything else harder to change. So it's 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 a bit more of the brown back today if everybody's okay with that. So please interrupt and ask questions as I as I go along. If you don't understand something, that's probably because I could not explain it right, and it benefits me a great deal if you pinpoint in that whole story where exactly am I missing something? Right. So the story mm -hmm. is um, simple. So we have. An academia of measure one so there are authors who write papers and then send it to a journal i mean we have five journals in our profession but without loss of generality they can be one um so there in the journal there is an editor who gets these papers and sends them to referees who are this very same authors and these referees are looking at another person's paper uh, look at it thinking whether it passes a threshold that the editor told them that they need to pass a threshold and then send back to the editor and then editor looks at the referee saying this this is above the threshold this is below the threshold and here's why i'm thinking that and uh, then something gets published and something does not get published and the funny thing about this system is that there is a backlog and it's not just economics it's it's all over the place and there are different people who fight it differently so there is there was an, an paper that the, there was a journal that stopped uh, accepting new papers because it had a backlog of two years they were like we need a couple of years before we run out of the backlog mm -hmm. then we'll start considering new papers and there was a medical journal who at some point said, you know, our backlog is terrible, like three years or something. So we decided that all the papers that we decided that they are accepted, we just are not going to publish them. They are not accepted anymore. And like, send us more of your papers. Right? <laughs> so that, was, that was met with uh, general disapproval in the medical profession. But uh, like, it's not, it's not just economists who are being, you know, stupid. It's like everybody who is adopting this system end up with a backlog, which is weird, right? Why? Like, I understand in the, you know, years of past when you had to, you know, print a journal, right? And you had to, you know, put it on the, on the pigeon and send it to the department. And if it comes to a pigeon hole and somebody takes a journal and it's like, you need more pages, the journal becomes heavier, the pigeon cannot carry it, right? So there are reasons why you cannot do that, right? But nowadays, we don't use pigeons for mail anymore. So like, why don't we just print more pages? Because we still like put them online and nobody's actually printing anything, right? And not, well, in economics for sure, right? But in other fields as well, pretty much if your paper has been printed, it's already old. Nobody learns from what's written in the journal. If something gets accepted in the journal, that's already enough for everybody who is working with promotions or hiring or grants. They are not going to read the details of your paper. They will not understand the details of your paper. They just need the verification check, right? 
and those who do care about the content other researchers right they either already understood your paper and cited it when it was a working paper when they saw it on a conference or whatever right so they don't need to see it published they already evaluated it and cited it and the profession moved on since then since the moment you were able to show it to other people right so I guess my point is, why do we have a backlog? Why do we have a capacity problem, right? And mm -hmm. editors actually say the capacity is a problem. I have a Twitter link from a guy who is an editor of uh, American Economic Journal, Applied Economics, uh, David Deming, who is explicitly saying that I had to reject a lot of papers that would be acceptable, but I will, but I did that because of the capacity constraints. And I'm like, what capacity <laughs> what what what's your like who who is making you enforce this capacity constraints about a year ago there was uh, an interview with esther duflo there was a like women in economics kind of conference and she was talking about her experience as an editor and she was saying that she does not have a problem in ar about capacity that she can publish more papers just submit more papers to us there is like no pro don't don't ignore us because you think that AR is too cool for you. Just submit it and we'll figure out if like we need more pages or whatever. But uh, capacity exists. I saw rejection letters that say, we reject you because we cannot accept everybody and we cannot accept even good papers like yours. So like, please submit it to another journal. Uh, so why is there a capacity? What does the editor want? What does they what do they achieve by imposing capacity? And what I'm showing today is a paper that shows why is it a problem that we have a capacity, right? So one could say, well, we could have a bigger capacity and higher standards and it wouldn't matter, right? Yes, but it actually hurts to have a capacity. And here is the reason why. Well, first of all, I'm sorry, one yeah, quick question, yeah, Sergey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, so is it not possible to interpret that basically like uh, this capacity problem is that actually like the acceptance threshold of the journal has increased over time? I'll show you the difference between the acceptance threshold and capacity and they have different effects. Okay. Okay. Uh, they have different impacts on effort in particular. So they are used by the editor simultaneously to achieve stuff that's my story and i need to explain why the capacity is an issue in itself that affects efforts and publications and other stuff okay so i am i am i'm calling this tactical refereeing i'm calling this tactical refereeing and not strategic refereeing because you can tell a thousand of strategic stories Right, so I am accepting your paper so that you will accept my paper later, right? Or I am accepting the paper of a friend of an editor so that the editor thinks I am a useful person and he will publish my paper. So I'm not doing that, okay? So weird stories about referring in different ways to affect other people's beliefs, that's not what we do. So my, my authors don't think they can affect anything like other people's beliefs by behaving strategically what they do is they just care about themselves in this sense it's tactical okay uh so what happens in my game is first authors write a paper then editor receives them sends the two referees gets the paper back decides to publish some of those some and not publish some of others fundamentals so what happens here uh what happens here is that Authors have ability theta, and they face a threshold Q bar. And Q bar minus theta is how much you still need to pass the threshold. And they can spend effort and make their paper better. And there is a question of whether effort is useful or not useful. Maybe it's like the paper becomes more beautiful. Maybe it's the paper becomes useful for the profession. I don't know, and I don't care. The important thing is that there are costs that you can bear as an author to make the paper better from the perspective of the threshold. Now, when you do that, you also add an epsilon before the referee looks at that. 
and that epsilon could be positive or negative. And that's why you have a probability that your paper is good enough from the perspective of the referee. That's the probability that the quality of your paper, theta plus e plus epsilon, is bigger than q bar. You pass the threshold. That's the probability of passing the threshold. And that's your payoff. And that's the probability that you got published if you had a good paper from the perspective of the referee. OK, so this is the outcome of the author's decision. This is the outcome of the refereeing process that does not depend upon the author. That depends upon how the refereeing system works. Okay, and that's a payoff that's going to be digitalized a bit later, endogenized a bit later. And when refereeing, authors know that there are N authors in the profession. They go to conferences, so they meet everybody who is in the profession, right? And they know that editor is not going to publish all the papers because the editor has mm -hmm. a capacity. So there is N candidates and there is gamma of capacity. Okay. So this probability that they see is the P. That's what the profession, that's the quality of the profession's paper making. Right. So this is their effort, my effort, right? But I know that other people have the same ability, face the same threshold, probably the same cost. So they will have the same quality of the, pro of the product. So they have the same probability of passing the threshold. Okay. So as a referee, I know that this is the quality of other papers. And I know that if a paper is good, other referees will lie about the paper with that probability. Why do they lie? I'll go in, into more details in the next page. But sometimes when referees see a good paper, they instead say it's a bad paper. It's not written well, right? You need more robustness checks. Why do you use OLS and not uh, two SLS or the other way around? Why do you have probit and not log it? I mean, this kind of stuff that's misrepresenting the quality of the paper, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what happens when N is big, but we have some results when n is not too big. So I write a paper, I submit it. I get another person's paper, I refer it. When I am writing my paper, I know that other people can lie about my good paper, and I know the threshold I need to pass. When I'm referring, I know how many papers out there can end up being published. And I know the quality of the paper in front of me. And I'm deciding whether I'm going to lie about it or not. OK, so decision here, how much effort to spend. Decision here, whether to lie about this specific paper. And then publishing happens, payoffs, realize, job done. So first, there is a subgame about refereeing. And then before the subgame about refereeing, there is an equilibrium about how much effort to spend. So far, so good? OK. So the first part, the authorship, has been covered in my paper from 2018 about publications referring and working hard. So I did not have the refereeing part, but I had the noise part, the chance to like get the opinion different from the authors, right? So what did we know from that? We knew that threshold increase. Uh, so these are the assumptions about, about all this stuff. What did we know? We know that the probability to publish decreases in the threshold and increases in ability. So if your authors become smarter, they have a higher chance to publish even when the effort is endogenous under a very general assumption with like convex costs and general single picked distribution of errors that, that pretty much works all the time. You may have jumps, like, but that's not actually affecting anything. So the quality of the paper improves with ability. The quality of the paper improves with the payoff. Efforts increase in the threshold for smart people and decrease for low 
but even though these efforts are not terribly monotone, the this thing, the probability to publish is monotone in the threshold. So this has been out for some time. I'm going to use it at the end of the presentation. Today, I'm going to talk only about the referring. So how referring looks like. Why do you care when you're referring? Because you want to be published in journals which are good. What are good journals? It's the ones that publish good papers, right? So you want to be in the journal when your dean comes and says, why do you publish in Journal of Economic Theory? You can say, well, here's a Nobel Prize laureate. Here's a Nobel Prize laureate. Here's a Nobel Prize laureate in my issue of Journal of Economic Theory, right? So I am publishing in the same place where smart people publish smart things. That's how I signal, right? I like the reputation of working in the field where something valuable is happening. I don't like publishing with hacks, right? So if there is a paper that's clearly wrong, so there was a, last year, I think, there was a story about a Harvard professor who published a paper about um, Japanese women, uh, no, Korean women taken by Japanese army into contracts for uh, what, what the, the, there was a name for that, but uh, I, that eludes me. Long story short, for sexual services for the army, right? And the person was publishing in Journal of Law and Economics or something, and wrote things like, "Well, they went into the contract. That's why it makes it law and economics, and that's why it's perfectly okay." And there was a huge letter from a lot of theorists of law who wrote that, no, that's not how law and economics works. This is a bad paper that needs to be removed. I don't want to be associated, not only with the journal where this paper, this terrible paper is published, but I don't even want to be in the field. I, like Even if I don't want to publish in the journal, I don't want this to be called law and economics because that's not law and economics. So Michael Chwe, I think was the guy in charge of that. And I think the journal withdrew the paper, but... Uh, like, if something angers us scientists is a bad paper published in a good journal because we want to be associated with good papers and not with bad papers, right? Right. So the simplest utility, why do you care, is you like good papers minus bad papers. And then when you're referring and you're looking at the paper, you're thinking, did it pass the threshold? And you see that it did pass the threshold. No matter what happens with other referees, it's better for you to say, publish the good paper or to say, don't publish the bad paper. It pays off for you to be honest if your utility is built like that, increasing in good papers and decreasing in bad papers by first order stochastic dominance. Okay? Uh, if, if there is no capacity, if there is no capacity, all referees are telling the truth. It's beneficial, strictly beneficial for them to tell the truth. If there are capacity issues, it's no longer strictly beneficial for them to tell the truth. Why? Because if the capacity constraint is not binding, it's beneficial for them to tell the truth. But if the capacity constraint is binding and they publish a paper, and they send what they have under revision to the journal saying publish that one. What happens is that editor will get too many papers. And what happens is that the editor will say, I reject a random one or random two or random three, whatever is the amount to fit the remaining into the capacity. Okay. And that could be my paper. So there is my paper that's under revision somewhere. And there is a paper I'm revising. If my paper gets gets accepted, right, and I accept the paper that I am referring, right, what might happen is that there will be too many papers, and that creates a, a stimulus for me to not tell the truth about a good paper. If capacity binds, if capacity might bind, it creates a stimulus for that. 
That's an incentive to reject good papers. Let me show you on the numbers. So S bar is the probability that referees, other referees, right, are lying about good papers. They are saying this is a bad paper. There is no incentive to lie about the bad papers. They are still bad. Nobody will in equilibrium publish a bad paper knowingly. P is the probability that the paper is good so that we know what else, how many papers can end up on the editor's desk, okay? And P bar is the probability that the paper will end up at the editor's desk. So it was good and nobody lied about it. I'm gonna take the utility like that in order to get some numerical results. I don't need to specify it, this utility to get results, but. I will do that so that you see how numbers work. The capacity is two papers. The number of authors is five. What can happen? So there are three kinds of papers from my perspective in the academia. One is mine. One is the one I'm referring. And three more, which I don't know about and I cannot influence. OK? So depending upon how many papers out of the type three end up on the editor's desk. My incentives about my paper that I'm referring might be different. So if there is no other papers that ended up on editor's desk and I reject the paper that I have in front of me, only my paper will publish, right? But if I accept that paper that I have in front of me, two papers will be published. So my utility of having two good papers in the journal will be higher. So difference between accept and reject is one, and that's the probability of having zero other papers on the editor's desk when I decide about my paper. Okay? This is like the hardest line here. There is more sophisticated math, but as soon as you understand what's, what's going on in here, it's going to be a bit easier. I don't see any hands up, so I assume I can continue. Uh, please, yes. Yeah. So if you have only one paper among the other papers, the probability is different, right? You don't know which of three there is a different binomial coefficient in there. If you reject the paper that you are making decision about, what's going to happen is that two papers will come out and one of them will be yours for sure. But if you accept the paper that you're making decision about, three papers will end up on the editor's desk and he has only capacity for two. So he will throw out one of them and there is a chance of one third that it will be yours. So the difference between that and that is now negative, right? Same for two. So here, there is a chance of one third that you will be thrown out. And there is a chance of one half that you will be thrown out if you accept the paper that's in front of you. So before you hit the capacity, you're better off accepting the papers. After you hit the capacity, you're better off rejecting the papers. So how do we end up with a probability about lying. We end up with probability about lying when the referee is indifferent, right? So the average difference with these probabilities need to be zero. Now, these probabilities are a function of gamma and N. It's not visible here, but it's clear that only the probability of a paper ending up on the table that matters for the decision, right? Because these are the probabilities. Uh, and this thing is only a function of gamma and n. And the shape of the utility function, but less, less explicitly. I can do the same thing with general gamma and n, and it's scarier, but the story is the same. So here, you did not hit the capacity yet until you have gamma minus two papers on the editor's desk. Then you hit the capacity maximum, and then it goes into the negative part, to the negative world. Okay. No questions in the chat. Um, yeah. 
So now I'm calculating the positive part and the negative part, and I'm looking where the positive part is equal to the negative part. And that's what I get. And it's scary, right? And the worst thing about it is that in here, you have a function of i. So that's that's like binomial distribution, and you're looking for something like one over n. So the average one over n squared. And that's that's unpleasant thing. But you can reshape it, you can massage it, and you can get instead of this polynomial, you can get a different thing. You can get a value that's not a function of i, and you can get probabilities about i. So instead of the probability of not hitting the um, the constraint, the capacity is equal to the payoff times the probability, the, the, the expected payoff. You get the probability of hitting the capacity and the probability of going above the capacity and the value between them. That's just the value of gamma and n. I really, I just got lucky in there. I did not intend it to be like that. Okay, I just got the formula and I was amazed that I could simplify it like that. All right, so is that useful? Well, if you have Excel, you know gamma, you know N, you know, you can solve for P bar. So that's an equation about P bar, All right? It cannot be zero, it cannot be one, anything in between can work. If capacity matters, it cannot be one. Um, you can do some results with that. For instance, if some referees are always honest, it does not affect this equation. If some referees are honest, it means that this equation doesn't work. Instead, it's going to be a function of some referees being honest, some referees are lying, right? And the lying referees will end up lying more. But at the end of the day, the probability to publish will remain the same from the perspective of you holding a, <clears throat> a paper in front of you. If you are like before, you were paid as, you see, good papers minus bad papers. If instead you are paid constant plus good papers minus bad papers, you will be lying more the more you're being paid. The way I think about it is if you are paid money for publication, right? You are not just motivated by your reputation, but you're also paid money if you get published. Then your, then your fear of getting rejected because there are too many papers is stronger because you will be losing money, right? The only thing you can do is reject more papers of other people. So you will be lying more. And you can play more with that. You can you can think about maybe you have convex uh, payoff functions. Maybe you are risk averse. I mean, you, you can get more results. I don't think there are any nice results. So this is a very nice result, very straightforward. But it takes a half, half of page to write out, but it's pretty much just by first order stochastic dominance. Um, this thing is pretty much just a change in the equation, and you you can you you just show that this thing does not depend upon how exactly you frame the p bar. At the end of the day, the p bar is the only thing that matters. But I like I stopped there, and instead I went into asymptotics. So instead of having like this thing does not give me an equation that tells me what's my p bar. Right, it's an equation that I can solve using Excel to get a p bar, but it doesn't tell me what happens if uh, my gamma goes up as a proportion of n. Right, because I have gamma and then discrete, that's not always a meaningful thing. Right. So what I do is I send it to the limit. I'm saying, well, let's say that the number of authors goes to infinity. And the share of publishable authors converges to alpha. So instead of looking at one issue, we are looking at all the issues of AR, right? There is a lot of authors and only some of them can get published, right? A lot of papers, but only some, some of them can get published. So this is a probability and this is a probability. If I have a lot of 
people. I have a lot of binomial samples, binomial random variables, right? That, 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 are, that are summed up. A binomial variable of a lot of successes. I can think about it as a normal distribution. So I can calculate the average, subtract the mean, which is going to be a p-bar, divide by the sample variance, multiply by square root of n, and then I'll have a normal random variable in here and the normal random variable in here or something close to a normal random variable in here. And I have the right-hand side here that will look something like that. So this thing will converge to alpha squared, right? So at the end of the day, I'll have something like probability that uh, you were below the threshold and probability that you were above the threshold on two sides. And in the middle, it's going to be a thing that's connecting them over alpha and P. And when you look at those, you can think, well, where can this P bar as a function of N converge? Can it converge to alpha? Yes, it makes sense. So you would have phi of zero here equals to alpha over alpha. So that's one phi of zero here. So P converge to alpha makes sense. Can it converge something less than alpha? No, because then you would have a plus infinity in here, minus infinity in here, right? So you would have one equals to something times zero. No way that can work. All right? Can it converge something bigger? Also no. Can it converge to nowhere? I don't think so. Like that depends upon how gamma behaves, right? I'm not exactly sure yet how it, how I can guarantee that it doesn't converge to something stupid. Like it doesn't oscillate around alpha with a big enough gap or something, right? But I don't think it does. Like if it is converging to something, it converges to alpha. Okay. So this gives me a result of referring as a decision of uh, like, like an equilibrium in the refereeing sub game of my whole game. Okay. And now I have, I can do author referee interaction. So this is my decision about lying. The bigger is P, the more I'm lying, the less is the chance of an honest report. This is the decision about publishing, which is the function of lying. The more people lie, the lower is the payoff. The lower is the payoff, the less efforts I spend. Okay, so this line here is the outcome of the refereeing subgame. This line here is the author's response to the outcome of, of, of the refereeing subgame, where they intersect is the outcome lying and probability to publish as a function of chosen Q bar threshold and alpha capacity. What happens if I have a smaller, smaller alpha? If I have smaller alpha, I'll have more lying, I'll have worse papers, right? Smaller capacity hurts. What happens if I have a higher threshold? If I have a higher threshold, there is a smaller chance to publish, but there is less line, which stimulates effort. So that's kind of beneficial, right? At the end of the day, it might go up, it might go down, but it could work. So why do we live in this world with lying? What's, what's the benefit in that? Why don't we live in this world that maximizes effort? where we increase the capacity, which allows referees to not lie, which allows everybody to spend more effort, which allows to increase the threshold. This point maximizes the effort. If editors wanted to maximize the effort, they could do that. They want something else. And this is where I am currently struggling. So what I'm thinking is, I think what they want is that they want their journal to be a good signal about ability. I think the world is, well, simply put, right? 
two ability levels, right? Maybe there's more, but with two ability levels, I can show you, right? So you cannot have different thresholds for different ability levels because people don't exhibit their ability levels. You cannot really, you know, I wish people could, right? Well, we wouldn't need, we wouldn't have so many universities in the world, but <laughs> if people could just, you know, show their ability, that would be, that would be nice, right? Uh, I think what happens is that editors make it harder to publish. Like they, they, they make referees lie to lower the payoff from publication, which lowers the effort for everybody and which makes the ability more useful for everybody. So in the, in the ending result, the proportion of papers from people with good abilities is higher, which makes publishing in a journal a better signal of your ability. I think I have an example where that works numerically. I need to be more certain that I did everything correctly before I show it. But the story is like that. Editor wants mm -hmm. the probability that you are good conditional on publication to be higher. In order to do that, they lower the standards and they lower the capacity, which makes it less likely for both types to publish, but it disincentivizes worse people more. And that creates bigger proportion of highly able people who end up being published. Um, and Sergei, editors don't uh, care about those who did not get published because they don't, they just nev nev never matter. Um, there is a question for you in the chat. Okay. Up, up, up. Why do you assume that all the refereeing has the same cycle as your author submission? Usually it never happens. Eh, I don't see why. Well, well, it affects the strategic interactions, right? But uh, in terms of tactical interactions, it doesn't really matter. As long as I, like, as long as the paper that I accept might compete with me in terms of the capacity, I don't care, right? So it could be a post on arrival thing that, you know, sometimes gets vacuumed away by a new issue or something. Um, it's more math. I don't think it's, it's going to be a different result. You are invited to refer for the same journal only after definition the decisions taken on your paper. Uh, counter example, me. I was invited as a referee without any papers in the journal. I was invited as a referee after being rejected. And I was invited as a referee during my paper that was revised in the journal. So like, maybe I don't think it matters much. So I'm not modeling junior people who never published. I'm modeling senior professors of Harvard who are submitting papers to JP, right? We referee for the list of journals, but publish in different ones from the same period. Yes and no, because like it's not really our choice, right? Our editor's choice. They don't really care about not publishing you while you're referee. I mean, maybe Leonid can tell better examples, but I heard about people having like 40 papers refereeing during the year while they were able to submit like two. So like I don't I don't think it's anyhow uh reg regulated by the editorial profession I, I i think it's happening simultaneously enough like in my model it's too simultaneous maybe right but i don't think there is a reason why it mismatches besides you know revisions and submissions taking so much time in economics uh, did I answer your question? Maybe. In terms of pictures, that's pretty much it. So alpha is too low. I think it's because of the heterogeneity with respect to theta. Uh, there could be other reasons that I did not explore yet. Uh, 
but like that's that's the problem with you know how um, it would be easy to show that that a behavior maximizes effort like in Anna Karenina that every happy family is happy in the same way it's just unhappy families are unhappy in different ways so it could be that different journals do that for different reasons right it's just this one thing that cannot happen is that this capacity thing cannot be consistent with maximizing efforts of a cohort of people let me put it like that yeah so what i'm doing is i'm adding a referring layer uh, i want to explain why people add capacity everywhere and i don't think it's because they want to improve efforts of people submitting i think it's because they want to do other stuff and i wish i had an ability to like collect all the other stuff they could be doing there is a paper called uh, there is a journal <sighs> book called the secrets of economic publishing which is like a compendium of um, articles by editors of all kinds of journals where they talk about their own editorial experience and what i learned from that book is that different editors want different things so like i'm not sure that this my selection thing is necessarily the thing that drives low capacity but it is a thing that drives low capacity so yeah and you see why i am reluctant to like say i'm done and start submitting it all over the place i kind of need i kind of need to recognize a final message and and i'm i don't think i'm there yet yeah thank you for your time uh we have about eight minutes for questions if i really if it oh, thanks uh, sergey uh we actually have more than eight minutes but uh let's see if there is enough questions to fill this time uh any uh, any comments questions and uh bernardo please may i start as usual <laughs> sure yes uh, well uh, thanks sergey for the presentation um sorry I, I still have like the the same question at the beginning because i'm thinking that the uh, i don't know if i have a fixed capacity and if I don't want to hire more pigeons or if I don't want to uh, put more stuff online then uh, my thoughts at least I mean I'm not an editor of course so maybe I'm probably wrong but uh, I'm thinking that rather than rejecting randomly I would try to increase the quality of the journal by selecting the the best paper so I'm I'm a bit uh, no but for that I'm you a can, bit confused you can, about that okay. why you can like, manipulate uh, you can manipulate the threshold right if you want better papers, you can manipulate the threshold. Uh, no, but I, I'm just like so uh, I, I, I don't propose know. Let's, let's Bernard ask the question, please. Bernard, go ahead. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, yeah, like I, I don't uh, agree with the assumption that the uh, the editor reject rejects randomly papers. Like uh, mm -hmm. I, I would like uh, rank them from better best to worse, and I would just uh, delete those that I. Uh, don't like even though they are above the initial threshold like I, I mean i'm not sure if i explain myself yeah more or less so let's say you are an empirical economist and you hate people who uh do bayesian statistics and you like people who do frequentist statistics right maybe you would delete bayesian statistics papers that that's random enough it's not because of the quality of the paper it's because of your tastes right maybe you can give a story that referees respond with the not with the accept or reject but they respond with their signal and then the editor throws out the middle guys right not the people who are like at random but like who are above the threshold but not too much above the threshold right he's throwing out accepted papers that are not tall enough this does not differ from increasing the q bar fundamentally but you can argue it's a random thing because it's just randomness goes from seeing five papers and throwing out three into randomness of who got a lower signal or who got a higher signal because remember for this model all thetas are the same and all efforts are the same. The difference is only in the noise. So from the perspective of modeling what you described, 
I think my model encapsulates your reasoning. But uh, there is a story about multiple referees agreeing between themselves, right? So if you, and as an editor, you send three referees your paper, right? Then referees start thinking, should I reject this paper? Should I lie about it or not? And then they are thinking, if I lie about it, what would the editor think about me as an author, right? And then they will be lying about low quality papers from the point of view of their signals and not lying about high quality papers, again, from the point of view of their signals, right? There are stories in there, in this strategic interaction of referees. I threw out all of the strategic interactions at the beginning to keep the model simple. Is there something that would go against my argument in there? I think if the editor wanted a higher effort, it would be better to keep the capacity the same, but increase the threshold and up in here. Well, maybe move a little bit here if you cannot change the capacity at all. Increase the threshold even more and up in this corner. That would maximize the effort. Lying lowers the effort for everybody. So I, I think there is a story why editors do that, but I don't think maximizing effort is the story behind it. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, Maria, Maria has a few questions, please, Maria. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sergey, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, can you take your slides off just so we can see each other? Just, All just together, okay. Uh-huh. Um, I don't think you're gonna like it. Uh, okay, uh, I actually have- <laughs> My slides are better. <laughs> yeah, I actually have four questions. First, uh, my first question would be about submission strategies. Okay. It seems that you assume that, that uh, submission strategies uh, to journals are exogenous uh, uh, in terms of uh, like uh, selection process. However, I think in reality, it's not that the case because if almost all papers are rejected, then I will be very much like interested in polishing my paper to increase the chances to be accepted. But if the probability of accept acceptance is uh, like higher, probably I would incur other effort in terms of uh, preparing the quality of submissions. That would be my first question. Do you want me to list all questions first? And like I think what you explained is my effort thing. So, I agree that uh, different people might have different submission strategies, but I kind of decrease the dimensionality of this decision into having ability and having effort. And different ability people, like for instance, people who are native English speakers and who are non-native language speakers, they might spend different amounts of efforts when they submit, right? Right. So I, I think, you can add this dimension. I don't think it will break anything. But what I'm, what the important part I'm doing is I'm saying there is one journal. I yeah, can do multiple journals. It's just it's more math. Yeah, that's my that's going to be my second question about. Uh, do you do you think that the adding one more, one more or extra journals would somehow change? Uh, like the, the story behind that, because that would mean that uh, for a referee, not for referees probably, but for the editors, the decision of rejections or acceptance would be actually really dependent on other journals, etc. That depends upon what, how much do you believe in the usefulness of the noise between the author and the editor. So between the author and the referee. So if it's an idiosyncratic thing and people don't learn from the past rejections, then it doesn't matter. If you can oh. learn from the referee's report and you can add more effort, right? In the interim, it's gonna be harder to do it mathematically, but I think the story remains. There would be a threshold for lying and the ability to revise might 
make it easier for people to lie because I'm lying now about this paper that's getting, you know, competing with my paper now. If my paper gets accepted, I don't care. This paper that I just rejected, it might still end up being published, right? So if I add this additional step of revision, I think what it's going to lead to is more lying. But I don't think it's going to break the rest of the story. Uh, I'm not sure that I got your, your logic correctly, but there, if there is another journal, and if I'm the editor, I'm interested in make, making my journal better, right? Sure. Which means that uh, if there is no other journals, it doesn't doesn't hurt me to reject some good papers right. because those good papers they can't end up in competing journal, right? Because if if I reject good paper in, and if this paper goes to competing journal, that's uh, that's a okay. You're talking me, about right? from the perspective of the editor. Okay, go ahead. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's like about acrylic of paper. Some journals rejected that. Uh, it and it ended up in quarterly, yep. uh, quarterly journal of economics, and the journals like raised up in rankings. Everybody, right. wow, 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 what we what we did, right? So that might be another dimension here. Yeah, that's a yeah. I simplify by saying there is a good paper and a bad paper, and uh, long long story short, I don't think it matters much as long as referees don't care about that. Like if the referees only care about the amount of good papers, they end up with 100% good papers in the journal anyway, right? Okay, Maria. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, yes, yes, I do probably have like final question that's about incentives uh, of the referees. Uh, I don't want like to, to complicate the story, but being a referee, it seems that uh, our incentives are a little bit more complicated in the way that in general, I'm interested in the good reputation of the journal, which means that I want to select good papers, but I also like uh, if some paper is fits exactly in my topic, I would probably be more like uh, would increase my quality bar not to allow okay paper on my topic which compete to my papers to go into the journal mm -hmm. so that's maybe some tricky issues here strategic issues here as well yeah that's probably actually it. that could be a way of uh, testing it because uh, if you are as a referee more stringent to papers that are close to yours that would be exactly <laughs> the test of what i'm doing right so there was a paper by de la vicardo de la vigne in ar about a year ago where they got responses of different referees and they didn't have the identities of the referees. But if you had the identities of the referees, you could see if people are stringent, stricter <laughs> about papers in their own field compared to papers in other fields. But yeah, I, I, I think I ignore the field story, but I think that could be a good way of testing what I'm, what I'm proposing. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Maria and Sergey. Uh, any other? Questions, please. Questions, yeah, I do have a question. Sure. Uh, um, actually, it's, this question is very much related to Maria's question, because it, for me, it seems that lying for a referee seems a bit irrational, because if I'm a referee, and most likely I would lie about the paper of a better quality than mine, Okay. because I want my paper to be published. But then in long run, the quality of an average paper in this journal would be lower. So then this would be a worse signal in the future. So why would I have a paper in the journal that would have a worse signal for me? That's why, why would I lie as a referee? Because if you don't publish in the journal, you will not get the, any signal, right? So the journal can be awesome, but since you never published in it, nobody will know you belong to this reputation. No matter how bad is your own paper, you would rather publish than not publish. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Sergey, if I may, um, a couple of comments. It's not really questions. Sure, please. Comment number one, uh, uh, I think it's possible to rationalize the capacity constraint. You made a good point that 
the marginal cost of adding another paper to a journal is more or less zero. You don't publish them anymore. They're all online. But if I'm an editor of a journal, I've been on the editorial board, never uh, editor in chief for a few. Uh, then, uh, of course, I'm interested in uh, maintaining the perception of my journal as something that publishes, you know, high quality stuff. So there should be some capacity control. And uh, I'm not saying that numerical capacity, like 10, 12 papers, a certain number of pages is the best way to go about this. But they cannot think of other ways, unfortunately. So just uh, journals want to remain some exclusivity to stay competitive, and so, especially well-established journals. And also, uh, journals want to be attracting readership. Uh, I would like someone to wait for the next issue of my journal, look it through. And if there are 20, 30, 40, 50 papers uh, in every issue, then uh, that becomes a more difficult task. <clears throat> and the pu publication in that journal would be less attractive for a prospective author, because the author would know that uh, her paper is going to be lost among several dozen of other mediocre papers. So I guess <clears throat> that's one reason to explain the capacity. You know, it's uh, very simplistic, but it probably holds some water. Secondly, uh, I, I have a general problem with your story and uh, with Stanislav's question for that matter as well. And my problem is that uh, the environment, the actual environment where we send papers and them published or rejected is uh, a competitive one. And uh, it's like the competitive market. Uh, we are all sort of price takers. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the impact of my decision to reject a good paper on my own publication prospect so uh, since there are hundreds, thousands of authors, and as Maria correctly mentioned, much more than one journal is going to be minuscule. <laughs> and it can simply be discarded. It would be the same as if I were a consumer <clears throat> and buying a product on a competitive market, I would uh, deliberately reduce my demand uh, in order to reduce the price. That's not going to happen. That's a competitive environment. <clears throat> so uh, your story might have some sense if all of the endless editors, or reviewers for that matter, collude with each other, but uh, and collectively maintain, you know, acceptance standards as they would like them to see, but there is no collusion. Of, uh, this is all anonymous. And so uh, it's a nice exercise, but uh, it's uh, application to reality, I think is a bit problematic for, right. for the reason that I just uh, mentioned. Right. So in terms of the quality maintenance, as I said, the capacity and the quality are completely different variables. And you can have a high capacity, higher capacity without without losing the quality. As for the readership, I don't believe I read a single issue of a journal in the last ten years. Like I was googling for a specific paper, and sometimes it was easier to get it on the J store than you know as a working paper. But like I don't think we read journals. Like I maybe did it a couple of times when I was on a PhD program and that was because I subscribed to a paper version and it was just mm -hmm. like some cost fallacy kind of thing <laughs> that I had a paper journal and I didn't read it. And I, I don't think I, I, <laughs> any, any of these papers were useful. <laughs> but uh, I, I need better ways of convincing people that what, you said is not inconsistent with my model. And if I'm not doing it yet, I need to do it more and better. And I good. should do good, that good, good. in the next couple of weeks before the submission deadline uh, for the good point. So, but, uh, but, but again, the main argument is that the likelihood that any individual uh, reviewer's decision is going to be pivotal. And it's going to affect the uh, the prospects of publishing my own paper. No, no, no. That's what that's why I do the asymptotic thing. It, 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 it's a, it's a little bit far fetched. But I mean, it's not. That's it, why I do the asymptotic format. <laughs> yeah, but I agree. And I guess <clears throat> finally, in reality, uh, the decision to accept or reject uh, rests with the editor. Sure. So uh, and editors read papers and uh, uh, they read through uh, 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 they read through referee reports, of course, but they also read papers and they don't make. So uh, if an editor sees that the referee report is flawed, and the editor, of course, has the incentive to maintain high quality standards in her journal, then this report will be suppressed and the person will not be invited to be a referee anymore. So that's another aspect of reality that you might want to add in your story to make it 
more. Yes and no. Here. So I had uh, referee reports where people were suggesting me to cite a specific paper that was cited in my paper. Like, <laughs> oh no, I'm sure, I'm sure that for some people, referee, editors and referees referee, read the papers, referee but I'm sure that sometimes it. they don't as well. And there is a way out from this predicament because uh, uh, editors have limited time and they rely on referee sure, sure, sure. reports and they take it as a signal. And if they see that the respected referee wrote a bad report, he thinks probably the paper is sloppy, but they would still have a look. Right. Anyway, thanks. I appreciate your comment on this. And let's see if there is anyone else uh, willing to continue this very exciting discussion. This is a, you know, this is a paper that your work is something that all of us awaited for a long time because now we have some consoling explanation of our papers. <laughs> Sometimes I reject it. Uh, my general uh, response to that, well, uh, you know, you wrote a poor paper, or at <laughs> least you failed to convince the editors that your paper is good, but now there is another one. It's just because some some opportunistic uh, reviewer is not uh, is not stupid to understand my good paper, but is deliberately lying about my good paper. I've and got Maria I've got has, two questions in the chat. Maria has uh, yes uh, uh, yes. Uh, so Tatiana, please. Did you uh, take into account somehow that many journals share their year views in Publons, so anybody can read the review? Will it change anything mm -hmm. in your model? Eh, eh, I mean, I never, I, I have some Publons, but like I never went there because, uh, like, I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> you know? But uh, making refereeing letters public. That's actually what some people do. So notably Kenneth Judd and Ivo Welch publish referee reports from their rejected papers and uh, comment on that. And that's a lot of fun to read. Uh, will it change anything in my model? I don't think so, as long as, you know, the referees are anonymous, you know, that doesn't really matter for anybody. And Maria has one more question. Yeah, uh, I'm probably not very typical reviewer, but, when I make a decision on how to review a paper, for me, the key issue is how much effort should be spent on the referee report. And I don't think there is a symmetry about understanding whether the paper is good or bad, because it's normally easy, easier to understand that the paper is bad, not to be published, than to be assured that the paper is good enough. Okay. So first, first, what I do, I just decide whether it's really, really matters and need to use some time in an effort in re in like careful readings through proofs and everything. And after that, if I do so, then I decide whether like strategically say something about quality, etc. But but in in your logic, or uh, it's like. It's the same effort in terms of uh, understanding whether it's right or wrong, which is, mm -hmm. I think, a little bit changing. Real well, I don't have refereeing efforts. Right. So uh, what you have, you have, have referee de strategic decision. But I, I think that in many cases, referee maximize a little bit different things uh, somehow. Right. So if uh, it's harder for a referee to make a case for a positive decision, I think that's going to increase lying. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks uh, for, for that. Uh, in, in fact, I think it's a good point. One uh, possible direction for development of this paper would be not so much uh, uh, lying or being dishonest, but about the incentives of the reviewer, uh, because so far what you're discussing are the and, and reviewers might be making deliberate mistakes, or but they might be uh, simply uh, uh, saving their efforts and uh, uh, don't not, not doing a, a job good enough to provide a quality review because they're saving time and shortening of some sort, and that might be a more uh, plausible incentive for writing a sloppy report. Not because you want to reject a good paper, but because you had a superficial glance at the paper and uh, you didn't uh, quite understand what this paper is about. And before you decide to go at length, spend your valuable time understanding, you say, well, that's a piece of crap. Right. That's, that's another. Just, 
just possible. just that little bit of what Leonid just said. That's why I think that several journals are important because journals compete not only for good papers but for good referees, right? And uh, journals policy would also affect the referees incentives to do a good job. That's that's why strategic uh, interaction between journals might be important in in several dimensions. Uh, okay, well, I, I believe uh, the time will be up soon, and uh, we can probably leave it at this. And I would like to thank uh, Sergey for presenting a stimulating piece of work, and wish him every success in uh, having this paper published, despite of this. Uh, uh, resistance of opportunistic reviewers make this really a compelling case for publication so that people would be ashamed to say no All right and uh, uh, Bernardo please uh, can you uh, as always tell us what's coming again uh, yes well uh, thank, uh, first of all thanks Sergey for the presentation I, uh, as someone else said I also feel much better about my re rejections now yeah. that it's about <laughs> referees lying and not about the poor quality of yeah them. it's not it's not they hate you it's that they like themselves, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a, a quote in Game of Thrones. It's like, "I like you, but I like myself more." So, uh, so well, coming in two weeks, we will have Massimiliano Bratti from the University of Milan, and he will be presenting his paper titled "Education, Health, and Health-Related Behaviors: Evidence from Higher Education Expansion." So that's going to be on the seventeenth of February. So exactly in two weeks' time. So, well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, yeah, have a good evening. Indeed. Right. Thanks, thanks very for much. coming. Bye -bye. Thanks for the questions. If you have more suggestions and questions, please email. Be safe. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.